Okay, hi guys, and welcome to today's show. Today, a bit of a mixed offering. Uh, we're going to finally look at the review of the Passage, the Seiko Passage, that my good friend Arthur has very graciously lent in. I hope you well, my friend. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sending that beautiful watch in. Uh, also, we're going to be uh, doing an unboxing of my latest acquisition, another Tudor. Yes, I think, I think I've been bitten by the Tudor bug. Before we get into all of that, I've got to do wristwatch check. Keeping it very simple today, i got the little classic Casio F91W on the camouflage. If you're a member of the Facebook group, you would have seen my wife has been wearing this a lot. Um, so, uh, and it's got her into NATO straps, which I'm really, really pleased. So if you were a member in the Facebook group, you would have seen that. Actually, looking at the time, I'm very late. This is actually, this is actually my lunch break. Uh, so I've got to go back to work now. But anyway, just thought I'd uh, throw this video together for you today. Um, so without further ado, let's roll the intro and get into today's video. Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show and today we are finally reviewing the Seiko Automatic Presage. This is the reference number SARW025. This of course is a Japanese domestic model entirely made in Japan in-house by Seiko. Now this watch is special for a number of reasons and we have to kind of rewind a little bit and go into Seiko's very unique and special history to fully understand the significance of this timepiece. Now if we rewind right back to the early days of Seiko, uh, Seiko was of course started by Kintaro Hattori. He was only 21 years old when he first opened the uh, Hattori watch and clock shop in Tokyo's Kayobashi district and he began uh, building and repairing watches. When he was only 31 he uh, teamed up with an engineer and he set up Seiko Sha, which is the uh, Seiko we all know love today. Now, way back then, he was quite kind of prophetic at predicting the rise of the wristwatch. And in 1913, he released his first wristwatch. And I'll be sure to, to include a picture of it on the screen. So you can see, undoubtedly, the inspiration behind today's piece. Now this, of course, was a manual wind piece. It was only 30 millimeters wide in diameter. It had a very striking porcelain enamel dial, which is typical of, you know, uh, pocket watches and, and, and the like of that era. Quite a European looking aesthetic. And the first thing you'll notice is the similarities to the piece we are reviewing today. At the time, Seiko was very much still in its infancy. Uh, Seiko Sha, the company, hadn't managed to produce its own components, so a lot of it was imported, and thus production was very, very slow. However, uh, by 1910, Seiko Sha had managed to produce its own balance springs, and by 1913, its own enamel dials, which enabled the Laurel to be completely in-house, basically. Uh, so just a staggering achievement, considering it's 1913. And of course, with the outbreak of World War I, uh, which kind of saw the popularity of wristwatches become more dominant, especially in the Western world, now, really ahead of its time and, and quite a staggering story. So you can see the, the, the historical importance of this piece today. Fast forward to 1956 and Seiko released their first fully self-winding automatic wristwatch. To mark this occasion, at this year's uh, 2016 Basel World, Seiko released a a whole line of presage and domestic models to kind of uh, celebrate that because it's been 60 years this year well the time of the recording of this review to mark the occasion of Seiko releasing their first automatic timepieces so not only is this piece uh, greatly inspired by the the iconic laurel back in 1913 but also to mark and commemorate the 60 year anniversary so let's have a closer look now it's not going just as of yet. I'm gonna wind it up. I let it run down so we can show you the, 
the uh, power reserve indicator and of course we have the date rather unusually in the sub seconds at first glance it looks like sub seconds but that is actually the date uh, they've gone for this beautiful texture and if we really look in close reminds me of the texture on, a, on an oxford shirt and of course without a doubt the first thing you'll notice is that 12 in red paying homage to the laurel and of course those numerals in that very turn of the century font so the dial layout um, very much kind of plays up that old world feeling the hands as well are very typical of that period and then we have a seconds and minute track running around the outside with an applied logo kind of modernizing it a bit now it is sapphire glass uh, which <laughs> is very very contemporary but we also do have an exhibition case back now i believe the exhibition case back is hardlex which is uh, seiko's own proprietary crystal and inside we see the 6r 72b movement which is the premium movement from the 6r family and it has got some decoration. We've got some uh, kind of Cote de Genève style finishing on that rotor and some uh, polished beveled edges on the, the bridge there, contrasting brushwork. Uh, we don't have any blued screws or, or perlage or anything overly uh, complicated, but it is nice to see a bit of an effort there. It is hackable, of course, and obviously we have manual wide. Fully automatic, has a 45 hour power reserve. That's a 29 joule movement and it operates at 28,800 vibrations an hour. So uh, we have quite a nice smooth sweep to it. The case of course is entirely stainless steel. We have beautiful brushwork on the top and then uh, on the sides, high polish, which is just done exquisitely well. I mean, something I, I, I've always said this about Japanese domestic models, the quality, the finishing is, well, it's it's almost at a luxury standard. Now, the case shape and style is very, very much of the earlier part of the century. The, these kind of curves inwards, a little bit more contemporary. The laurel had handle style, almost like a converted pocket watch. Then we have a stunning kind of cupcake style crown there which is of course signed with this the Seiko S something you'll see on all the domestic models and then a smooth bezel running around the uh, the outside now you'll notice this sapphire glass is it seems flat from a profile but it is curved and you'll see the distortion just just that in an angle there now let's wind her up and as I wind her up you'll see over here the um, power reserve indicator and off she goes with those beautiful blued hands so let's keep topping her up i love the crescent moon balance on the second hand it's a really nice touch my only negative is i have a suspicion that the hands are not blued the the traditional way they are I think painted simply because of the way they look. I'm not 100% sure, but if we look on the subdials, the tip is only blued, uh, and that is a bit of a giveaway. Also, they they don't have the same luster as true blued hands. I could be wrong, but guys, if you know, um, do tell me. Uh, of course, you know to have hands blued is quite a costly and um, involved process. But then again, at this price range, we're talking well under a thousand dollars. It's excusable. I mean. We've already got so much going on here with a, with a really fantastic movement and a, an amazing quality to the finish and production. Uh, you know, blued hands and then fully decorated movement, that would have just driven the price up uh, incredibly. So, um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm willing to forgive it. Now, let's quickly get the dimensions out of the way. Now, Arthur, I, I, who's lent this in, don't worry, my friend, I have sellotape on the calipers. We've got a diameter of 40 millimeters. We've got a thickness of 13, quite thick. Lug to lug, we're looking at 48. And then lug width, we're looking at 20. The size is very, very much contemporary. This is actually a lot closer to the size of pocket watches uh, back in 1913 than it is a wristwatch. But I can understand, you know, it's the 21st century and they've updated the size. I would have liked it to be a little bit smaller. I also think it's very, very overly 
thick. I'm sure that movement could have been uh, contained in a, in a thinner case. It's a shame because this is obviously a dress watch. We don't have any loom, it just wouldn't fit with this kind of design. Also with this style of hand, it just wouldn't work. However, its weight, uh, we're talking about 97 grams. I think the weight, it does have a very sturdy, solid feeling to it. The construction, the finishing is undoubtedly, you know, of a luxury standard. I'll, I'll say it again, you know. We've got 100 meters water resistance. So let's talk about that dial layer. I love the retrograde. Uh, look here and I think it really works. I love the texture of the dial. I love how they've um, added a bit of kind of silver detail to the power reserve and I got to say the lettering the quality on the dial is exquisite. It really is exceptional. It's very impressive. We just have automatic signed italicized there and right at the bottom if we see Japan movement and at the back we're there we have made in Japan and also we do have in this particular movement some degree of anti-magnetic protection pretty much standard on all the 6R uh, line nothing exceptional but uh, definitely uh, one of the pros of, of this family of movements now it comes on a strap this is a very nicely done uh, leather strap compared to most straps you get with a Sago, it's certainly a step up in quality it has this uh, push button deployment there uh, i'm not a big fan of these and while i was trying this watch out i actually wore it on my own straps i put it on a collar rib i'm just it's it's personal taste guys i'm just not a fan of these particular deployments there it's just personal taste but i gotta say the strap is nice my recommendation would actually be something like this. I've just recently got this in. This is from Swiss Tech, and they make absolutely stunning, uh, genuine crocodile straps. As you can see there, this is a beautiful burgundy. This is the padded burgundy. Remarkably, only, I think it was for about $49 on eBay. But just imagine this strap on this watch. Even better. Dark burgundy, the stitching to match the dial. I really think it would work beautifully i'm just I, you know it's just my preference but anyway i just thought i'd uh, show you so quite versatile when it comes to straps so let's get a quick wrist shot and here we are with the wrist shot now as you can see it's incredibly tall it wears very large mainly because of the quite wide lug to lug measurement and also it's so tall I feel it's not very comfortable at all, to be honest, and I'm a little bit disappointed. While I understand that the watch's significance historically, and I think as a design, the layout, the dial, the attention to detail and the quality is there, its size, its scale is just over the top. If you've got a larger wrist and you don't mind about having a thick uh, dress watch, then it's probably fine for you. But for me, I think it really it's a bit of a disappointment, I've got to say. I, it's a stunning, stunning watch, very classy, with a ton of heritage, obviously referring to its rich history. But I'm disappointed, I really am. And so used to wearing the Seiko Saab 033, and even the cocktail, uh, which was 40 millimeters, the same diameter, wore a hell of a lot smaller. I'm not a fan of this uh, particular pliant either. I, that's just personal taste generally a bit of a disappointment and it kind of breaks my heart a little bit to be honest they missed the trick here they should have gone with a little bit thinner they should have gone with a 38 millimeter size they should have actually blued the hands properly rather than using paint which i think is a bit of a cheap shortcut although it does look good and it gives that impression of quality i mean you know, I, guys, I'm, I'm really nitpicking here, but accuracy-wise, I'm getting about plus 10, 11 seconds. So not the most accurate of pieces, but it is very robust. Obviously, the 6R uh, family, we all know and love. While it is extremely robust, it's not the top performer when it comes to accuracy. Plus 10 seconds really isn't the end of the world for me. What really affects it is that tallness. I mean, just look at how chunky. I mean, look, let's let's compare it to the Janeiro here, and just look how tall it is. It's ridiculous, and that is a very complex Valjoux chronograph in there. So if they can do that with a chronograph, 
There's no reason why they Seiko can't make this a little bit thinner. Really defeats the purpose of a dress watch. And I'm going to have to say it really ha has kind of let the watch down. But having said that, everything else is beautiful. If you want something a bit chunky but with a ton of heritage, then this is for you. However, for me, I dread to say it, but bit of a bit of a letdown, bit of a disappointment. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Let's take it back to the studio. So, um... What a disappointment. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I, I really was expecting something a little bit more. I feel it's a big missed opportunity on behalf of Seiko. They could have made something incredible. I would be willing to pay, you know, a grand more just to have it more decorated, just to have it thinner, smaller, more elegant. I feel it was rushed. I almost feel like they they didn't complete it. it, was unfinished. And I haven't really done a bad review. When I mean a bad review, I haven't really done a review, because obviously most of the watches I get in, I choose or I get sent in or they're recommended by you guys. And most of the time, they're great watches. I try not to pick watches that I'm gonna loathe, obviously. Um, so very rarely a watch comes along where I'm genuinely disappointed. And I, I have to say, I. I'm almost a little bit angry about it because it could have been so great. It could have been. I think that's the um, the, the overall feeling of, of this watch. And especially because it's the 60th anniversary of uh, their first uh, uh, automatic watch and it's paying tribute to the, the classic Laurel. Why would they half step that? Why would they not go full all the way and make something truly amazing. I mean, imagine the Grand Seiko movement in there, fully decorated, uh, re you know, nice and elegantly thin and smaller case. It would have been something very, very special indeed. I, God knows what happened there. I, and not all the Presage watches are like that. I feel like the rest of the Presage line are, are really nice. I just, I, I'm a bit, I don't know. I, Anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts, queries, and opinions in the comments, please. So, a bit of a disappointment, but something that is not a disappointment, and that is uh, my latest acquisition. So let's change perspectives again and have a look at my latest Tudor. Now, unfortunately, the box is so large, I can't actually fit the entire thing into frame. So I'm just gonna speed up this first bit. Apologize about the sirens. I am, of course, using my Kershaw Leak, my favorite little knife. So uh, let's get into it. So here we go, right. So a box within a box within a box. Now I've got to figure out how to get in this one. There we go. Oh, and there we have it. So, well, it's a Tudor, but which Tudor is it? Oh, I'm a little bit nervous now. Um, right, drum roll please. Oh, 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 so yes, it's a Tudor Submariner. Oh, the salmon pink dial. <laughs> oh, look at that. I'm salivating. I'm literally salivating. Uh, let's, let's just have a look. There's a manual in here as well. So this is the old, old Tudor box, Prince. It's going as well. Oh, it's a nice size. This is the um, the mid size. Let's take the plastic off. Look at that. Let's let's turn that bezel. Wow, that's interesting. That is interesting. Let's make sure it lines up. Yep, it lines up. There we go. Look at that. A little bit of polishing, but not too bad. Got no, oh, look at that dial. Look at that dial. Let's, let's pop it on the wrist. So we got the old school. I forget the reference number, but I will do a uh, full, full um, review, obviously. But look at that salmon pink. Something a little different with the um, steel bezel insert. There is a little dink there, but it's to be expected. Oh, gorgeous. Really chuffed to bits with that. Let's uh, unscrew the crown. Look how thin it is. Let's have a look at the back. 
Very good condition on the back. Oh, that's nice. So we've got the UTA in there. All right. I'm going to set the time. What's the time we got? It's 10 to 5. It's... Oh, nice crisp date change, as expected. Keep going round and round. I can't get over that 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 salmon pink. It's like a coppery. It's gorgeous. So what is it? It's, uh, Ten to five. Is it? Actually, let's get a precise. This is my chronometer um, certified. T so it's actually nine to five. So let's put it to nine to five. There we go. Pop it back in. Give it a nice wind. So I'm gonna have to size the bracelet, and uh, I'll I'll test it overnight. A little bit of wear and tear, but it's difficult to do with gloves on. But there we go, done it. Let's just have a look at those lugs. Not bad at all. Not bad. Yeah, I'm gonna give it 24 hours. See how it performs. Uh, wear it and enjoy it. Has been polished. You can see this lug is a t uh, yeah, but not too bad. It's not that bad. It's not bad at all. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. As long as it performs, I'm very happy with that. Gorgeous colour. Something a little bit different. And I love the size. It's very... Let's just get in the GMT. That's the GMT. So you can see the size difference. Look at that. Very cool indeed. So it's a bit different. I, I was kind of inspired by the Yachtmaster a little bit. But I still wanted the Submariner. Fantastic. Let's have a look at that. Anyway, stay tuned for the full review. That's if it passes. Yes, gorgeous. All right, let's take it back to the studio. Okay, welcome back, guys. So, uh, my new Tudor. I am going to be doing the full review. Uh, I was, wasn't was really planning to buy this, but recently I've been kind of wheeling and dealing. A lot of my friends, um, and when I mean friends, I'm talking about outside of the channel that I've known for years before I had a channel also getting into wristwatch i think they're watching <laughs> they've been watching the channel which is great so a lot of people i know have kind of commissioned me to buy watches i've been wheeling and dealing make a little bit of a profit here a little bit of profit there i also had that uh, 450 dollars of ebucks to spend i i did actually buy an amiga then i changed my mind i sent it back and i decided to go for this tudor i was considering buying a zin again I think the 656 and then or the 556 so either going with the newer 556 or a used 656 oh, these these numbers I mean I hate reference numbers <laughs> it really annoys me I can never remember them but anyway um, I very very nearly bought a Zin but I think Tudor you know they're not making the Submariners anymore and this was one of the last references I think second from last or something uh, one of the newer Submariners before um, they, they, they stopped making them, of course. And that mid-size, it's a sweet spot. Cheaper than the, the full size. Obviously, the mini sub is too small. 33 millimeters is too small. So I, I went with this one. Most likely, I'm not going to lose any money. I think, I think used um, and vintage Tudors are definitely going up in price. I think they're really good buys on the used market. Um, whether I keep it, where I sell it, who knows? We'll see. I'm going to wear it. I'm going to enjoy it. Uh, if I do sell it, I'll buy more pieces to review for the channel. I think that's my modus operandi <laughs> right now. So, yeah, I'm just going to enjoy it. But anyway, stay tuned for the full review. Uh, thoughts, queries, questions, opinions, all the rest of it down below in the comments. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I'll catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.